Uh, thank you very much, and I will try to be brief because we are short on time. Um, I was here on Tuesday and I gave an overview presentation of e-health technology. Uh, today I'm going to wear my professor hat and I'm going to talk about very specifically the technology of sensors. So I'm going to try to teach you a little bit about what sensors are and how we use them. So um, a sensor is a device that converts a physical or chemical property into an electrical signal. And they're actually quite complicated devices. They include a, a, a component called a transducer that converts energy from one form into another. Electronics, computers, software, telemetry, and power, all in one small device. And that's what we call a sensor. And the goal of a sensor is to monitor something. It might be monitoring the light in this room or the temperature, or maybe it's monitoring your heart rate or the amount of glucose in your body. They are systems, and I teach a course on sensors, and we get into a lot of detail, but what uh, we have to understand, and these are very complex systems, where we take energy from the environment, we convert it into an electrical form, then we process that using electronics, and then we digitize it, and then we do further processing on the digital signal, and then we send that eventually to the computer or to the cloud or wherever it's going to go. And we have to remember that sensors require energy. Everything requires electrical energy, and this is something that we forget about. This is particularly important in medical applications because we don't always have energy available to us in the applications we're trying to use sensors for. Now, we are in a golden era of sensors. We're about to see an explosion in the number of sensors that we see. And the reason for that is because of the Internet of Things. Perhaps you've heard of that. I saw that this is one of the priority issues for France now with President Macron stating that the Internet of Things is one of the high priority areas. In the Internet of Things, we're going to be monitoring everything, not just people, but uh, buildings and cars and trains and sewage systems and um, things that you never thought you would want to monitor, we're going to be monitoring, and that will require 50 billion sensors. So we're going to see a lot of sensors, and so we can now leverage that. We can take advantage of the fact there's going to be so much sensor development and bring some of that over to health and medicine. By the way, just some terminology, I am a, um, I do a lot of work in IoT. We, we have three parts to IoT. The very uh, the part where the sensors go, we call that the edge of IoT, and the reason for that is because that's where the digital world meets the physical world, so that's the edge of the digital world, and we call that the edge. And then there's the backbone, which carries the signals from the sensor to the servers, and where the servers are sitting, we call that the cloud. So in most systems, including most medical applications, we're doing the same thing. We're converting a, a physical signal into a digital signal at the edge. We transfer that signal through our uh, wireless and cable and optical systems to the servers, and then we process that information in the cloud. And you're going to see that uh, paradigm over and over again, not only for the Internet of Things, but for eHealth as well. Now, the edge is a very uh, high-tech area. There's a lot of work. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we are going to see 50 billion devices of these by uh, 2020. There's a huge amount of effort in the electronics industries and in related industries to build many, many different types of sensors, and we can benefit from that. But they're very complicated. There's a lot going on in them. I don't have time to go into all of that. Now, generally, we can divide sensors into two types of sensors. There's physical sensors and chemical sensors. And physical sensors are the most common sensors. They monitor physical things, like they monitor movement, they monitor light, they monitor um, electrical signal, and so forth. Um, and then there are chemical sensors, and chemical sensors monitor chemical properties. They may monitor pH or the presence of a certain element or molecule and so forth. By far and away, chemical sensors are much, much more difficult to make. So I get people who approach me all the time and say, Mark, I would like you to develop a sensor for the brain, and I'd like to know when there's dopamine in the brain or something like that. That's a chemical sensor. That's very, very difficult to do. On the other hand, if you say, Mark, I'd like you to I'd like to know when your head is moving. Oh, that's easy, that's a physical sensor. I can do that very quickly. So as you, perhaps some of you are innovators or uh, thinking about how you can in introduce sens sensors into your own systems, keep in mind that there's a big difference in the cost and effort to produce a physical sensor and a chemical sensor. Now, we can put sensors in all kinds of places, and in fact, people are doing that. I'm going to break it down into different regions so I can give you some examples of each uh, one. First of all, we have the implantable sensors. These are devices that we're going to put inside the body. And then we have semi-implantable. These are sensors that don't go, they, they go inside the body, but in a way that's safe and easy. 
And then we have uh, wearables, and of course you've heard about in the first presentation, wearables such as Fitbit. These are products that go on the body. And then we have handheld. These are devices that you hold in your hand that uh, monitor something. And we have interactive sensors, and these are sensors that are designed to be used in an interactive way. And finally, we have environment sensors. These are sensors that go into the room or go into the space that you're in. So when we think of health, these are all the places that we can have sensors that can inform us about our health or help us lead a healthy uh, life. So there's a lot here, and uh, I only have 10 minutes to go over that, so let's go. All right, first of all, I wanna give you some guidance. In terms of the difficulty and cost uh, of these types of sensors, this is the order. The most expensive, the highest risk, and the, uh, the most technically difficult sensors to make are the sensors that we implant in the body. Okay, so many times people come to me and they say, Mark, I can buy a Fitbit for, you know, $50. Why can't you put this thing in and measure my heart moving? Okay, that's a very different type of sensor and it's extremely difficult to do. It's gonna cost a lot of money and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, the sensors that are monitoring the temperature in this room, for example, in the thermostat, those are easy and they're cheap. So when you design a system and you wanna use sensors, keep this chart in mind because it will help you guide you in terms of the kinds of ways you might want to accomplish your goal. You don't always have to stick a sensor in someone's body. And I, I, I'm very shocked and surprised how often people want me to put a sensor in someone's body. And if, we don't need to do that, you know. How often do you really need to know the temperature? Maybe once a day, well, maybe they just use a thermometer. You know, so um, keep that in mind. All right. Let me start with the plantable sensors, the hardest one. There are so many issues we have to consider when we're going to put something inside the body. And I do build and design quite a number of implantable devices. Uh, of course, we have biocompatibility, we have safety, we have efficacy, we have, uh, these things have to survive, typically work for 15, 20 years. Uh, they have to be very small because if we're gonna put something in the body, we want it to be small. Uh, they have to, they have to get their power from somewhere, and we don't, usually don't like to put electronics and batteries inside the body, so we've got to figure out how we're going to get power into our sensor. And then they, they have to get that data out of the body, so we have to have telemetry. Typically, it's going to be wireless, and then we have to worry about packaging and the procedure that's going to be used to put it in the body. So it's actually a very difficult problem, um, and that's why they're the highest risk and why it takes so much money. So if you were to ask someone like myself to develop an implantable sensor, it's going to take time and it's going to take money. So we don't want electronics, we don't want batteries, and we don't want uh, to turn someone into a cyborg. We want uh, very small sensors. So here's some uh, So now the good news is we do have uh, techniques to, to design and build these things. And one of the most powerful techniques we use is miniaturization that we borrow from the semiconductor industry. So we take many of the same manufacturing techniques that you use to build computer chips, and we now use those to build sensors. And that allows us to make them very, very small because we want small if it's going to go into the body. Um, now, another thing about implantable sensors you should know is one of the biggest problems we have with an implantable sensor, I might be able to make it small, I might be able to make it effective, biocompatible, and so forth, but I always struggle to get energy into that sensor. I need a power, I need, and I don't want to put a battery. For example, I'm working on a project right now for a startup company in Orange County. We're building an interocular sensor, a sensor that goes in the eye. It's so small, it's smaller than an eyelash. It gets implanted in the eye, and it tell, monitors the pressure of the eye. Well, you know the biggest problem I have is how do I power that sensor? So we have to look to strategies for zero power sensing. Can we have a sensor that works on no power? And there are in fact ways to do that. For, and here are six ways that um, I teach my students on how you can design a zero power sensor. You can use local energy harvesting, where you create energy from the local environment. You can do remote charging, where you use wireless energy to charge it up. You can use reflected passive reflective energy. You can use uh, uh, s signals that come from light, and you can do energy conversion. You can do indirect sensing. I don't have time to get into all of that, but there are ways, in fact, to design a sensor that requires no batteries, and that's what we do. Now, here's some. Um, some examples of implantable sensors. These, um, most of these uh, examples come from the eye because I do a lot of work in ophthalmology. But um, these are devices that are designed to be put into the eye and monitor the pressure of the eye. Now you know that glaucoma is the leading cause of blindness in the United States, and glaucoma is caused by increased pressure in the eye, and so there's a big interest in um, monitoring the pressure of the eye, and these are examples. And these are all manufactured using that semiconductor manufacturing process that I just described to you. And uh, they all are wireless, and they all use uh, 
indirect energy, where we send energy and it collects energy and then it can, it can do its job. Um, here's another uh, implantable sensor. This is designed to measure electrical signals in the brain. And this was also manufactured using the semiconductor process. So we take a clean room designed to build a computer chip, and instead we build a sensor for the brain. This one uses biocompatible material that we had to develop specifically for this process. So this is a brand new material that we can uh, uh, use in the clean room, and then we build these little electrode arrays. This particular device has eight electrodes in it, and it can monitor the electrical signals in the brain. And this is used for hearing research, and these are actually being sold now by a small startup company that spun out of my lab. Um, something you should know about implantable sensors, most, at least in the United States, is very difficult to make a business model about an implantable sensor. It's hard to uh, to make money off of that because there are no reimbursement codes. And you know, in the United States, everything medical has to have a reimbursement code or you're not going to get paid. Um, there's no reimbursement codes for a sensor. There are reimbursement codes for uh, an intervention that improves health. For example, a knee implant or a hip implant, that's going to make you better so you can get paid for implanting that into the hip or to the knee. But the sensor, if I put a sensor in there, it's not going to make you better. It helps you monitor, so it's hard to get a reimbursement code. So what I have found that the companies I'm working with are doing is they're creating implantable sensors, not so that they can implant it separately, but so that it adds value to their current implant. So if I were building a hip sensor and I added a sen I'm mean, sorry, if I'm building a hip replacement, and I want to sell more of those hip replacements, maybe I'll add a sensor to it to give it you know, a higher quality and a, a better uh, device so that I'm better now than my competitors. And so the companies I'm, I've found, the way that they get implantable sensors into the body is to provide it as part of another product. OK, let me move on. Now, semi-implantable sensors are similar, but the risk is a lot lower because we're not leaving it in the body. And here's a great example of a semi-implantable sensor. Uh, this is a small uh, pill that you swallow. It has a camera on it. And as it goes through your digestion, uh, your, uh, your intestines, it takes pictures. And it sends those images outside while you're, um, while you're uh, sleeping. And it takes approximately 24 hours uh, to 48 hours for this to pass through the system. But one is doing that is taking pictures of your, of, you know, of your gastrointestinal tract. The nice thing about this is you can now see things that would be very hard to do. You might have to use uh, endoscopes or something like that. And now we can use this little pill. And the risk is much lower because this can have electronics and batteries in it because it's going to leave your body in about uh, a day or so. So we don't have to worry about the same issues with that. OK, let's move on quickly. So wearable sensors, we're all very familiar with wearable sensors. I think most of us have, uh, may have some sort of a wearable sensor on us right now. And these are devices that monitor, um, uh, that you can put on your body and monitor things. Most wearable sensors are physical sensors, so they're really just monitoring very simple things. They're generally monitoring activity. So Fitbit, all it does is monitor your movement. It doesn't really mo monitor much more. There have been attempts to monitor heart rate and so forth, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But the main benefit is monitoring activity. So you're not going to be able to re render any kind of medical diagnosis from this type of thing, but you will learn the general trend, the general health activity of the uh, the consumer wearing this. Most of these wearables are designed to be used with an iPhone or an Android device. Okay. Now, where we're going with wearables is we're going to have wearables that have many sensors on them. So there's one wearable will monitor not just activity, but maybe ECG, maybe, um, you know, maybe uh, pulse oximetry and so forth. And we can build those. Those are uh, technologies that are coming down in price that we now put into a single device. So we, uh, we will soon have uh, devices that monitor many things at once. And now it becomes actually probably quite useful for assisting the, in the way that we do health. Here's an example of a wearable uh, sensor that I talked about on Tuesday. This is a pregnancy monitoring device. It was developed at UC Irvine, my home institution. And this gets uh, attached to a, a pregnant mother, expecting mother's uh, tummy and monitors when the baby is moving. And that way, you, could, you know at all times that your baby is healthy. And so forth. it uses a small strain sensor that when the baby moves, it stretches. And um, then this is recorded to the computer. So a very simple example of a sensor that can actually provide uh, peace of mind and benefit. All right, here's another example. This is an electrochemical sensor. Uh, so this is a chemical sensor now. We've been talking about physical sensors mostly. And this one can detect analytes in the sweat. This is an example of, a, another, electro, uh, of another chemical sensor. This uses microfluidics, very small fluidic channels in a, in a flexible uh, material that can now uh, 
do wound monitoring. So if you have a, a cut or a burn and you put this uh, Band-Aid on there, it's not just a passive Band-Aid, it actually has fluidic channels in there that can draw a sample and deliver sample to the wound and so that you can monitor what's going on in the wound. So these are a little bit more sophisticated now because they are chemical sensors, but this is where we're seeing a lot of activity, smart wound uh, monitoring. Now, I'm going to turn our attention to the next class of sensors. These are handheld sensors, and these are devices that you hold in your hand, and this is a good example of a handheld sensor. There are about 10 of these on the market. Um, this is a device that monitors uh, asthma, so you breathe into this device and it can monitor your airflow and monitor your volumetric flow and so forth. And it's used to, to monitor how someone is, is recovering or how they're doing uh, when they have asthma. And uh, they're relatively simple devices and there's a, a lot of them on the market. There's also glucose monitoring and so forth. And we're going to see a lot more of this as we move to the microfluidic world and point of care diagnostics where we have microfluidics and so forth that can do. I'm gonna breeze through quickly interactive sensors. These are devices that are designed to work with a video game such as the handheld device I showed uh, at one on Tuesday that, uh, that monitors your hand movement and allows you to play video games such as music uh, such as a Guitar Hero, so that you could now combine this with therapy. In this case, it's combined with physical therapy. Okay, we have a, okay. Uh, this is, by the way, this is new. Interactive sensors is a relatively new field and there's a lot of opportunity here. So if, you've, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to get into a new area, this is something where there's a lot of activity, brand new stuff going on. So I, take, I, mentioned, I, I mentioned that to you so you can take a look. Finally, environmental sensors, they are the easiest and these are things that are gonna monitor what's going on around us. They're easier because they can be big, they can have batteries in them or they can be plugged in and they're generally monitoring relatively simple things like airflow or air pressure or, um, you know, things like that. And so we're going to see a lot of these as people try to live healthier lives. Okay. Here's an example of environmental sensing that monitors a bed. So when someone is sleeping in bed, if they don't move very much, you need to roll them over because you worry about bed sores. This will help inform the, the nursing staff that uh, someone needs to be turned. Or if you have a patient with dementia, for example, in this case, then uh, this will monitor when they've moved or they haven't moved or if they're walking around where they shouldn't be walking. You can now tell that someone is in trouble. And uh, of course, I love Japanese. Uh, they have the smartest toilets in the world and they have a lot of sensors that monitor how you're doing when you use the restroom. You also get a health diagnostic. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for environmental sensors. Okay, so we're gonna see these everywhere. Uh, many places to put them. And some of this new sensor technology is high-tech stuff. The, the, uh, the microfluidics, for example, and the, um, the multi-sensing units. Uh, but keep in mind, the sensor's value is in the application. So whenever you design a sensor, you have to design the full application. So I, I, I give this as a, a, a advice to my engineering students. You cannot design a sensor in a vacuum. It must be designed for an application, and we're gonna see a lot of applications. Thank you.